Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you all to join us uh, for the this cast talk today. Another very interesting subject. So as you can see, the, today we have a talk by Dr. Vitor Greenblatt from Synopsis Chile. But today we are here to attend the, the talk by Victor Greenblatt. So Victor Greenblatt has an engineering diploma in microelectronics from Institut National Polytechnique de Grenoble in France and electronic engineering diploma from Universidad Técnica Federico Santa Maria in Chile and a PhD on IoT for Smart Agriculture at the IMS Lab, University of Bordeaux. He's currently Research and Design Group Director uh, and General Manager of Synopsis Chile. He has expertise and knowledge in business and technology and understands very well the trends on the electronic industry. Therefore, he is often consulted for new technology business development. He has published several papers in IoT, DA, and embedded system development. And since 2007, has been invited to several Latin American conferences in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Mexico, Peru, and Uruguay to talk about circuit design, EDA, IoT, and embedded system. Since 2012, he is the chair of the IEEE Chilean chapter of CAS Society, and he is also the president of the Chilean Electronic and Electrical Industrial Association. He has been part of several conferences, TPC, NISCAS, ICCS, LASCA, and he's chairing the DDA and Circuit Design Subcommittee for ICCS. He's also his program chair of uh, Food Cars. Since 2018, he's chair of LASCA's steering committee. So thank you again, Victor, to accept our invitation to give uh, this talk today in a very interesting and hot subject. So I give the floor to you. Uh, to start uh, your talk. Okay, so thank you very much, Ricardo, for this uh, introduction and, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good, e good evening to everyone that is uh, in this talk. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot see each other, so I hope that people are attending that and uh, I hope we'll have a lot of questions at the end. So the, the topic is it's very important, mostly because we are also living at the same time the COP26 in Glasgow, where we are talking about uh, the, the, the climate change, or the global warming and so on. So the main question is how to feed a growing population while conserving the planet's resources. And of course, uh, we are saying that IoT is uh, to the rescue. So let me try to give the, the agenda of this talk. So we are going to talk about the problem give some main concept of an architecture about IoT, how to improve the soil productivity, and some conclusions. So the problem, and, and, and it starts a few years ago, I was putting some plants in my country side home. So I start to irrigate them. I put more water, and I was very, very happy. And suddenly, uh, some of them die. So I was surprised. And my first conclusion was that plants need more than water. So I say, okay, so we need to understand what is happening with plants. So I started to study that, and I found that uh, plants need a lot of, uh, there are a lot of parameters that uh, influence the plants grow. You have the environment temperature, the weather condition, the salinity of the soil, the texture of the soil, the temperature of the soil, and, and, and the pH, and you have the humidity and the nutrients. And the main question, why it's so important? So, and the first problem is that the population is growing. Even that the rate of uh, the annual growth rate is going down, we see that the population is growing and we are going to be around 9 billion by 2050 and more than 11 billion by the end of this century. So we have more people to feed. And after that, uh, we see that the arable land is decreasing. So the number of hectares per person that can be allocate to uh, agriculture is decreasing. So we move from zero, mostly 0 0.4 hectare per person in 1965 to uh, less than 0 0.2 hectare per person in 19, in 2015 and even 2021 and so on. So it, it, it's, so we have less place, less space to put uh, crops. 
And the climate change, we have been talking a lot during the last few days, the impact is causing rising temperature and associated climate phenomena. Short term, we have seen uh, climate variability, long term shift in mean cl climate condition, and agriculture is one of the most climate sensitive sectors. And on the same, so we say that climate change is a major challenge for agriculture. But at the same time, agriculture is responsible for one third of the global uh, greenhouse emissions uh, uh, because it's caused by agriculture, forestry, and change of land use. The, the methane, the manure, we have been talking a lot about methane in the COP26, the fertilizer, the biomass, and 47% of this one third is coming from land conversion. And if we look at the Amazon and what is happening today in this uh, big forest in Brazil, so we are converting part of the forest to agriculture that is uh, creating more problems on the greenhouse emissions and so on, so the, the, the greenhouse gases emissions. So it is important so that to, to understand that from an economic point of view, we also have to change. We, we can talk a lot in COP26 about how to change that, but if the economy is not following that, we will be in the same problem. So there is an interesting <coughs> study and a proposal from uh, Kate Rayward in 2012 called the Donut Economics, where she is uh, she's stating that the economy has to be inside this donut, where the lower limit is the social foundation uh, based on the United Nations uh, sustainable objective. And the upper level is based on the planetary boundaries that were defined by Johan Rostrop in the Stock from the Stockholm Resilience, Resilience Center in 2009. And what is in red in that in that part is that we are having problem with this specific part of the uh, of the world. So we have problem with biodiversity loss, the land conversion, nitrogen and phosphorus loading, the climate change. We are also having problems not there on the ocean acidification, and also on the social foundation. We are having problems. We have a political voice, the social equity, the gender equality. So. She said, Kate, that we have to be inside this donut. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations is saying that for 2050, the current agricultural production needs to be increased by 70%. So how we do that? And we also have the problem of the fresh water. The agriculture is the heaviest consumer of our planet's available fresh water. A lot of people think that industry is the heaviest consumer. It is not true. Agriculture is the heaviest consumer. And we are losing a lot of water as well. Agriculture global water demand is estimated to increase by 19% by 2050. And we see in this, in this graph coming from the World Development Indicator that Europe has a good balance between domestic industry and agriculture water. But if we look Latin America, 72% of the water is dedicated to agriculture. And uh, if we go to South Asia, it's 91%. And there are places in Latin America and Caribbean, and I'm sure of that, where you can find water for the agriculture, but you don't have water for the people or the domestic. So we need to better balance the usage of water as well. And farmer distribution, this is very important to understand the problem. 80% of farms operate on less than two hectares of land about 500 million farms smaller than two hectares. So we are talking that the majority of farms are small and medium uh, farmers. And in the poorest country, 70% of land is operated by farms smaller than five hectares. And those small farms are very are not adopting technology. So when you say, no, no, we have drones, we have this, we have that. No, no, this is not true. For the small farmers, they are not adopting technology. Why? It's too expensive, hard to use farmer digital skills and communication availability and cost. So any system we are planning to do are to take in account these four requirements that are not based on technology, but are more based on the usage, on the users of that. Uh, when we say, for example, farmers digital skills, uh, there are places in the countryside where the, the people can use some kind of messaging system, WhatsApp or something like that, and that's it. So if you start talking about putting a lot of technology in a, a user interface that is complicated for them, that will not be easy. So the summary of the requirements uh, we, we have for this uh, 
agricultural issues, more population to feed, less arable land, climate change, less fresh water, ecological footprint, low cost, low power, easy to use, able to communicate. And how to solve this problem? Okay, we are thinking that Internet of Things can be the solution. And on the other hand, we have this agricultural dilemma, which is to increase the productivity versus the planet boundary. So how to increase the productivity of the soil without affecting the planet? And this is uh, what I call IoT to the rescue. So I think that IoT can help to do that. So let, let's uh, do a little study about the main concept and architecture of architecture. Probably you already know what is IoT, so I will not spend too much time there. But what is IoT? There is a lot of definition, but for me, the, the best one and the one that is helping a lot is that is the connection between the physical world to the digital world. So we are connecting things that are physical to the, to the internet through a digital communication. <laughs> so what are the things? Things can be everything. We have a car, we have a flower, we have some uh, vegetables, a container, uh, uh, a food line production, a fish, a tree, a boat, the, everything. Everything can be a, a, a thing. And how to connect a thing to internet? So it's easy, we put a node, the node uh, we will define in a, in a couple of slides what is the node. This node will, will be connected in some way to the thing, the one, the thing we want to control, or the thing we want to measure, could be a pitch, could be a salad. And through radio link, it will communicate the data to, uh, to a gateway. And that gateway will be uh, send the data to the, to the network link, to the internet, to some servers. And of course, after processing, we can send that to the end user. How to connect the connection time and how to choose? It will depend on the on the application and the thing we want to do. So we have here a very interesting graph about distance and uh, uh, data data to be uh, to be sent. So if the distance is very small, like uh, one meter or ten meter, we can use and we have a, and we have a big uh, amount of data. We can use Bluetooth. We can use Wi-Fi. If the distance is short and we have not too many data, too much data to, to send, we can use ZigZigB. But if the distance are big, which is the case in agriculture, because in agriculture, we are thinking of things that are kilometers away, hundreds of meters away. So uh, we have the cellular uh, infrastructure, but the problem with cellular infrastructure is that it's not always available. There are places in the countryside where we have no even 1G. So we don't have 2G, 3G, 4G, we have absolutely nothing. And on the other hand, this is expensive because you have to pay the communication. So the majority of applications are starting to use the low power wide area network, uh, mostly six folks and LoRa, uh, that provide the capability to send data uh, several kilometers away and small amount of data. So if we are going to send, for example, I don't know the temperature of the soil, of the humidity of the soil, this is a couple of bytes. So we can do it and we can send that through six or so LoRa uh, several kilometers away. And uh, the main difference between the two things is that Sigfox, it's a proprietary uh, uh, infrastructure. So you have to use Sigfox infrastructure. While LoRa, uh, you can create your own way, gateway and uh, you can create your own uh, node to receive the data. And uh, both Sigfox and LoRa are working on the free band, uh, free band. So you can, you don't have to pay to use the, the band uh, to transmit. So where to process the data in IoT? So you have the cloud, the gateway, and the edge. Cloud is convenient when an action is not immediately request. However, we are having more and more bandwidth issues, and of course, we cannot send all the data to the cloud. So more and more, we are going to the edge. It's becoming common, it's very efficient, need for fast action. So meaning that we are going to process directly in the edge. Edge computing refers to the computation and analysis of data on distributed devices positioned at the edge of a network right, rather than a central, on a centralized system. And Gartner, <coughs> Gartner anticipated that 20 by 2025, 75% of data processing will move to the edge. And, 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 and of course, if we think in agriculture, if I'm uh, uh, measuring the humidity of the soil, 
So I can process in the edge uh, compared to a threshold if I need to irrigate or I don't need to irrigate. I don't need to send that data to the cloud, wait the cloud to process that and to send me back the, the order. I can do it immediately in the edge. So the architecture of the edge is very easy. We have the battery and the energy investor, so we need to be sure that we have enough power. Uh, it is important to consider that it is said that an, uh, an IoT system that could be autonomous should be alive for at least three years. So we have to make a very good power computation to be sure that the battery plus the energy investor, if needed, will be enough for three years. We have the sensor, the crate of the software, the processor, the storage, and of course the communication part. Uh, what are the, 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 the problems of IoT? So battery life is expected to extend while adding connectivity. So we are talking about that. So low power is a very important part. System cost, type of functionality, connectivity, and energy use this take cost. Uh, if we have to put, uh, I don't know, uh, hundreds of uh, IoT system in the in the in the countryside to measure things in the agriculture, they have to be low cost. Integration because we are going to integrate in the same kind of system: wireless power management, memory, sensor processor, etc., and security. Because even if we sync on agriculture, we have to sync on security. So power management is very important for uh, IoT, uh, especially on agriculture. So it spans software and hardware. A power budget for the edge should include, but it's not exhaustive, active sense of power, frequency of that data collection, wireless radio communication, frequency of communication, microprocessor, microcontroller power, passive component power, energy loss, power reserve. So when you are measuring and you are computing your system, you are designing your system, you have to be very careful on the power. We don't need to go to change the battery every day or every week if we are in the agricultural domain where things are very far. Uh, Agribusiness threats, so there's two IoT devices and sensors are the most dangerous and need protection. And what, what could happen? So a hackers or cyber criminal can access some data to predict market availability and price. This is one of the most important things. But on the other hand, if you go uh, through uh, IoT into the, the your network, you can go into your service and you can get a lot of information from your business. Malicious actor could sell farming information to competitor, and they can also destroy your production if they start irrigating more than needed or putting fertilizers more than needed, so they can destroy also your production. So how to improve the soil productivity, which is the topic I have been uh, researching and working for the last four years. So this is, uh, I, I, I retake that picture about uh, what are the parameters that are important. And in general, the majority of the system available today in the market, they take mostly the water, the, 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 they, they take care of the water, that part, so the humidity, but they don't take care of the rest. And the rest is very important. And you, and you will see that there is a lot of interaction between those parameters. So important parameters for plants grow. We have the soil parameters and the environment parameters. There is also the plant parameters, parameters associated to the plant itself, but I'm not considering them in my research because they are more invasive to the, to the plant. So I'm taking, uh, I'm working mostly with the environment of the plant. So you see there are some salads. So I'm working with the moisture of the soil, the nutrients, the pH, the salinity, conductivity, temperature, texture the environment or the light and so on but i'm not taking care of the for example the color the color of the of the leaf can provide a lot of information or some uh, chemical uh, emissions that the plant is doing i'm not taking in account that for the moment so i'm thinking on a, on a function the soil zero function which is the function about all those parameters and of course we have to still finding that the function is a linear polynomial exponential function uh, what is sure is impact by your species you don't have a unique a unique uh, function it's depend on the species so lettuce are different from tomatoes and one lettuce is different from another one basilic etc what is the important of each parameter so uh, and, and 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 one of the things i have found that depending on the on the development of the crop 
some parameter will be more important at the time and some other will be less important at that time. So, so they are changing. So how interrelated are they? Also, how they, they interact? Can we use machine learning algorithms to supervise and supervise? Uh, can we make a spice model for simulation? That could that is a, something I have in mind uh, for a while, and I will give you some examples in, later in this presentation. So the texture of the soil corresponds to the amount of sun, silk, clay, and organic matter. And it is important because it affects how good nutrients and water are retained in the soil. And of course, different kinds of crops need different kinds of soil. So the, the, the ideal soil contains equivalent portion of sun, silk, clay, and organic matter, which is ideal. Uh, we cannot measure that in real time because it doesn't change too much, too often. But it has to be considered. So it is an input <coughs> to my equation and to a system. And as I say, data will be used as an input of the IoT system to adapt to the texture of the soil because the, the, the humidity, the amount of water we have to put into the soil will depend on the texture of the soil. It's, it's not the same. If we have a sandy soil, it's completely different from a clay soil, also a silty soil. The most of this is uh, very easy to measure is uh, the water in the soil is classified in three categories, gravitation and non-available for plants and available for plants. So not all the water I am putting when I am irrigating is available for plants. So it's also something to consider. Uh, there are a few sensors that can be used, the resistive one and the capacitive one. Capacitive is more stable, but more expensive. They are found in the market. We need to act if it, if it is below to the irrigation threshold. And it's plan and time dependent. When I say time, it's based on the growth of the crop. So sometimes some crops need less water at the beginning and more water uh, when they are bigger. And all vegetables require soil most of between 41% and 80%. The nutrients, so this is, uh, there are 16 chemical elements that are important for plant growth. The most important non-minerals are hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. And of course, the main minerals are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. That is known as NPK. And you can start seeing, and I will show you how, how to measure that. How can you measure the amount of nitrogen in the soil? OK, so I try to think. Other minerals that are important is calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. And, and the big problem is over and under fertilization. So if I put. Too, sorry, too much phosphorus or too less phosphorus is, will impact negatively the plant growth and the soil characteristic. So how to measure that? I say there is a based on optical reflection characteristic. It's a sensor to be built. I have a first prototype that will show. And it need to act, need to act if not convenient for the plant. Uh, we can add fertilizers through irrigation. So we can add into the water and irrigate with that water. And again, it's plan and season dependent. So this is the prototype of the sensor I have been working. So you have white light. And uh, based on reflection, you can say based on the on the on the uh, on the on the on the bandwidth, sorry, on the bandwidth of uh, the reflection, you can start thinking of uh, the, the kind of uh, nutrient you have and if it is enough. So after you can compare with uh, some tables where you have the, the real amount of uh, this nutrient that you need for each crop. The pH is also affect the availability of nutrients in relation with plant roots and microbial activity. It's like a resistance. This is uh, sinking on spice. It's like a resistance. And NPK is less available in soil with low pH. Uh, I have not found so far an in situ sensor low cost. I'm using this one, which is Atlas Scientific pH probe, which is quite expensive. And there is another problem how to measure pH on a non aqueous uh, solution. Because normally we measure pH on an aqueous solution, we put that into water or some other solution, liquid solution. But how to measure pH in the soil? It's not very, it's not. It's not easy to do. Should not change very often. This is an assumption, but it will change based on the water, on the irrigation. Need to act if not on the accept range. Should generate an alarm and plant dependent action as well. So this is a, a graph that shows the importance of pH. 
So this is the nutrient availability based on the pH value. So we see that the NPK, it's, uh, it's between 6.5 and 7.5, and, but some other like the boron, the copper and zinc are for uh, brewer acid salts and so on. <laughs> soil temperature is also something easy to, to measure, but soil is a major storage for heat. So it's like a capacitor if you think of the spice model. Uh, it governs physical, chemical, and biological process, produce evaporation. This is a very important thing. So, you know, some people are saying, do not irrigate when the soil is too hot because it produces more evaporation. Uh, there is uh, some uh, sensor. This is one that I have been using and cannot act if out of range. If it is out of range, you can do nothing. That prediction would help and should generate an alarm, maybe to stop irrigation or maybe to start irrigation to cool down the soil. It depends on, on what you want to do. Salinity is a very important thing. A high soil concentration with some high osmotic potential of the soil solution. And salinity could be increased by over fertilization, the irrigation and water in industrial way. And the problem is that we can do absolutely nothing if the soil is, uh, the salinity is too high. And the problem is plant will use more energy to absorb water and under extreme salinity condition, the plant uh, will die. So it's like a resistance sinking in our uh, spice model, plant and time dependent. Uh, it's measured passing, by passing an electric current between the two electrodes of a salinity meter. And the, the, the way to change the salinity is to clean the soil. So you have to clean the soil, which is a very complicated and a very expensive process. And today, the way that farmers are doing, they send from time to time a sample of their soil to a laboratory who reply with the value of the salinity. So that acquisition for environment parameters, you have the environmental temperature and humidity, which is, of course, you cannot change. But there is a, the, you should generate an alarm because there is freeze effect of through on fruit trees or when the temperature is too high, there is also a problem with the, the, the evaporation. The weather that acquired from an external weather station, it is also important to know, for example, the wind, the wind can be, can generate more evaporation and the light can be modified only in a greenhouse environment. But if we are working outside, we, you cannot change the light. So I made some experiments at home because, uh, because of the pandemic, we are just going out, so just, now available to do some experiments on, on real salt. I use an Arduino, some sensors. Here you see that we are measuring the moisture and the soil temperature, the sensor around the red part. It was a four day experiment. And the objective was to analyze the correlation of parameters and analyze the passage from wet to dry. So, so how long it will take from wet to dry. So we found that the soil temperature is following like a sinusoidal uh, wave. Uh, and it took almost two days from, for, to go from wet to dry. So uh, that is important because, it, uh, and of course, we have to do comparison between different kinds of crops to see uh, how they are taking the water. And uh, on, the, on, the, on the right side of the screen, we see the soil temperature versus the soil moisture. And we see here the wet part and the dry part and the transition. We also work with cherry tomatoes. Uh, we measure soil moisture with a resistive and a capacity sensor. So we use two sensors for that. We measure the soil and environment temperature. It was a three day uh, experiment. And we we're also trying to compare the, the sensor to, to have a relationship between uh, parameters. And we also use different moisture at the beginning. So we start with a dry soil, with a wet soil. So the resistive versus of capacity most of cells are following almost the same curve at the beginning, it was a three days, but uh, now I'm working on a, on a longer period of uh, test because it is said that the capacity of sensor is, will stay longer, will be uh, more accurate in the long term. Environment soil temperature, so the red part is the environment and this, uh, the blue line is the soil temperature. We see that the soil temperature is very stable uh, why the environment temperature has a lot of peaks, and it is because of the, the, the it's it's changing. The soil is changing much much slower. It's not uh, affected by uh, immediate change. 
uh, capacitive sensor versus environment temperature. So to move from wet to dry, the same kind of uh, curve that we already show. Uh, soil temperature and soil moisture. You see, when we start with a dry soil, uh, it, it is changing when the temperature is going down, but it cannot go into the wet part. However, if we start with a wet soil, we see that the moisture will remain there for a couple of days, following the opposite <coughs> sorry, of the soil temperature, meaning that when the soil temperature is going down, the moisture is going up. This is a very interesting uh, constatation that we have to consider for future experiment and for the equation we are trying to, to create. Uh, we also use some uh, bell pepper, uh, measure in case soil moisture, uh, environment temperature, and so on. And this is the kind of graph we, we found. And once again, the soil temperature is more stable, some changes than the environment temperature. And the moisture is changing, and you see that, in, for example, we took the, 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 the peak we had at uh, 18 hours as uh, related to a soil temperature that is going up. So the moisture is changing when the temperature goes up, as we can imagine. So uh, based on these experiments and everything we have, uh, uh, we have found so far, we have the main requirement of the node, the device we are going to use, low power, because we are far from energy sources, able to send receive data far from internet connection, so we have to use something, able to process data at the edge, edge computing, low cost because it is intended for the small and medium farmers, easy to use because of the digital skills of the users and able to handle several sensors to cover all needed parameters. In general, today, the, the system we find in the market measure one parameter, but they, they cannot work with several parameters at the same time. So we have concluded that an SOC is then needed. Uh, so how to do it? Uh, a system to monitor crops. The company will be an SOC with some peripheral SIOs, LoRa and a battery. How it works, it gets data, data from sensor, process data in the edge, drive actuators, receive information, uh, for example, the weather information, send information to the cloud, send analysis result to the farmer. Why an SOC? Because you can say, yeah, but there is a lot of platform, why you need to create an SOC? The first thing is the lack of suitable existing platform. There are a lot of platforms, but they are not uh, well designed for the agriculture. It is a specific application. We need the low power, we need the low cost, and we need to be able to do edge computing. So this is the architecture of the edge we are proposing. So we have the SOC with the LoRa interface, the analog sensor, digital sensor, other inputs, analog actuator, digital actuators, and other outputs. Uh, we did a first prototype based on a, the EM starter kit from Synopsys, which is uh, there on the figure, and we put uh, uh, a soil moisture sensor, soil temperature, uh, environment temperature, the RGB LEDs to measure the, the light, uh, some, uh, some buttons, some, uh, a display, and after we put the same into a box. Here we have the pH sensor as well. And we were never able to, to try it on the field, we tried it on the lab because of the pandemic, but we will do it now. And this is the current development of, of the SOC. So you have here on the right of the screen, you have the schematic where you have the CPU and the memory. And on the, uh, on the left of the screen, you have the layout with the data memory, the CCM, and the uh, instruction memory. For the data memory, we have computed that with eight kilobyte is enough, but I think we put 16 kilobyte. Instruction memory, we are putting 64 kilobyte. Uh, which is a normal range for this kind of uh, platform. And we have divided the memory in two parts, so we can use, uh, if needed, we can use the instruction memory. Uh, we can use part of the instruction memory for more data. Energy and battery estimation. So we say that the total power of the SOC core is around 6.5 milliwatt. We are making <coughs> some assumptions. System with read write peripheral. 48 times a day. System will work for 60 seconds when reading, writing, and use and processing information. LoRa chip coming from Centec data chip runs at 3.3 volt and current 
and current during transmission is around 40 milliamps. Data will be sent once a day, 60 seconds are enough for the transmission, and energy during sleep time is considered, considered negligible. So the total energy is around 6 milliamp, milliamps per hour. So we say with a 10,000 milliamps hour battery, the system will be able to operate for almost four years. And considering only the core, only the core, because with the parts and peripheral, three years can be achieved. And the size of this kind of battery is around 159 millimeters times 62 times 9 millimeters. So it's a very good size. And we don't need to put energy investor because with this battery, we can run for three years. So uh, some conclusions uh, about that work. It's the first one agriculture provides our food. So we need to take care of that. Population is growing, so more food is needed. Arable land is decreasing. We need to improve the soil yield without affecting the planet. And uh, we consider precision, precision agriculture and IoT is the key. It is important to consider all relevant parameters and their interaction. We, we cannot just measure humidity or something like that because it is not good. We, we don't have the real, uh, we, we don't measure the real, the real stuff. We need to work with low cost sensor. Machine learning will allow the IoT system to work independently. Artificial intelligence will provide algorithms to improve the year. And something very important, we need to work close to agronomists and farmers because they know how to grow. We know how electronics work, we know how uh, computer science work, but we don't know how. Uh, we are working here with life. It is not, uh, it is not something that is uh, not moving. This is something that is interacting with the environment, uh, having chemical process, uh, physical process. So we need to better understand how they work. So before uh, going into, into, uh, into question, let me give you a few informations. The first one is, uh, Synopsis is hiring people in the Chile office, so uh, explore your possibilities with us. We have several uh, open positions now, so if you share your, your, our passion for innovation, we want to meet you, so you can <coughs> go into uh, this link or you can send a, a resume directly to job uh, Chile at synopsis.com and we will process your uh, application to our, the open positions. Uh, also, the Chile CAS uh, chapter will do, a, we have a webinar series on a, a virtual conference on November 18 with Professor David Atienza from the EPFL, who talk about sustainable cloud computing for a big data and uh, artificial intelligence world. So this is the registration, I'm going to publish that to, LinkedIn, CAS, and so on in the next couple of days, so you can register for that. Uh, we are also having our second season of school on technology and agribusiness. This time, the, 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 it is called Feeding a Growing Population. You can go to this web page to the program is coming soon, and the registration will be through the same web page. So uh, be aware it's from December 6 to December 10, every morning from 9 to 1 p.m. Chile time. GMT minus three. And the last thing I want to share is the last CAS 2022, Iber Chip and uh, Prime LA. Yeah, we are closing uh, today, but maybe we'll give a couple of days if you have papers to put there. Uh, what is important is that it's time to meet again. You know, it's, it's very important. We have been having virtual conference and virtual things for two years, almost two years, and it's time to meet again. So I invite all of you to come to Chile, to the south of Chile, to Puerto Varas, from March 1st to 4, 2022. Of course, we are monitoring, uh, continuously monitoring the evolution of the pandemic uh, to make timely decisions. But based on current information, I think borders will be open, so you will be able to come. It's a very nice place, and it's time to meet. You know, we have been trying to meet back for two years. Uh, I was in a conference a couple of weeks ago in France. It was so good to be there, to see the people, to, 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 to be able to talk with people, to, to have the gala dinner, the welcome reception, and things like that. The coffee break was really, really good. So please consider Lascas. It would be very nice. We'll have a lot of surprise. 
And that's it. Thank you very much. So we're open for questions now if you have any questions. So thank you, Victor. So um, I have a one question here from João Carlos Brito Filho. So thank you very much for the lecture. My question is, do you believe that ESP32 will be the future of machine learning in agriculture? In ESP32R, it is possible to run a simple neural network. Yeah, it could be, but you know, I don't like to be uh, tied to one specific technology. I will say, yes, we can do machine learning agriculture at the node, at the edge, but we don't need to be tied to one specific component. Uh, I have worked with other components, yes. Uh, the future of, of the of the agriculture is machine learning in the edge. Which one? That is something to be analyzed based on each uh, specific application. Okay, thank you. So if someone else has questions, it's time to do it. So waiting for possible new questions, I have one. So, um, uh, just to reinforce uh, one point uh, for the applications like in agriculture so which technology nodes you think that are needed the recent ones with uh, very small features or more uh, mature technologies you know in, in my own application i work with the i work with the 40 nano 40 nanometer from tsmc and it's it is too too small. We you can work with 180, 90 nanometers with no problem because we, we don't need to be too fast, too small. What we need is just accuracy and low cost. So going to the traditional nodes uh, will help on the low cost. And uh, what is more important is the uh, low power. So low power is more important, but. The, the, the node is not the important part. We, we can work with 180, 90 nanometers and 250 with no problem because we are not trying to be uh, too small. We don't need to be too small. Okay, thank you. I see no more question in the chat, but I have another one. So um, when we are talking about agriculture, uh, we can consider some... Uh, uh, big uh, uh, use of components. So these components can be small. The total amount of components uh, can demand a lot of uh, power consumption. So uh, what do you think about uh, the directions on this by using very dedicated chips, using the less amount of transistors in order to uh, have a lower power consumption yeah this is one of the things I, I have found in my research because you know one of the, the i started trying to find if there is a already existing platform to be used in agriculture but the problem is is the power uh, we have as i say we have to be sure that for example this platform well, let, let's consider another one the one that is going into cow or into animals so the animals will be also kilometers away and you don't want you, you cannot plug the, 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 the component uh, to, to charge the battery. So you have to consider that it has to be there for two, three years. So uh, yeah, you can put a solar panel, but solar panel is also expensive. So <clears throat> low power is the, is the most important restriction we have there because we have to be sure that the battery will stay for two, three years. So we, we, we don't have problem with that. Okay, so a question by Cristiano Chene. What do you think uh, are the better electronics companies for supporting SOCs for agriculture application? Well, that's a tough question. Are you talking about components? Are you talking about EDA? So if it is EDA, I will say Synopsys, of course. You can do a lot of things with Synopsys tools and Synopsys IT. Uh, I will say that in general, uh, we have to go to, to design our own chips as mostly all applications today, because the electronic is becoming more important and, and we have more and more people going into designing their own chips. 
One of the caveats we have today is the integration of the communication part. Unfortunately, uh, Semtec is not providing IP when we want to integrate LoRa into the same chip, into the same SOC. But I will say that uh, there are platforms that are available, but based on your requirement, you have to start analyzing exactly what do you need and if you need to do your own chip or if you just need to use an existing platform. And if you have to use your own chip, try to use IP, low power IP. Okay, so I see no more questions. So uh, thank you all for attending this session today. Thank you again, Victor, for the nice talk. And uh, see you next week on Tuesday for Ceresa 2021. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.